Hey, Flickering Myth family, editor EJ popping in right now just to say thank you so much for tuning into last week's episode. It's amazing to see you guys grow with this podcast as we grow it. Though, I'm going to add in, we have some growing pains. This week, about the first 18 minutes, which I know is quite a bit of time, but the first 18 minutes are a little rough on the audio department but then it clears up and it sounds amazing after. The video is still good, the conversations are great, just the audio is not where we would want it. We are so sorry about that, but next week's episode sounds all great. And again, it's only the first 18 minutes, which is about the middle of our Zack Snyder conversation. This was too good of a conversation to skip out on, so make sure you guys tune in. Again, sorry about the audio. Now let's just jump into the podcast right now. Hello everyone and welcome to What Should We Watch Tonight? A movie podcast where we discuss cinema's burning question, What should we watch tonight? In this show, we talk about things like hidden gems, undiscovered movies that we need to find again, and also new releases and things like that. My name is EJ. And I'm Tony. Tony, I am glad to be here with you once again for another episode of this podcast. The first two I thought were amazing. We had such a good time. We have a lot to get into this week, though. Absolutely. I'm very excited. It was a lot of fun these past couple episodes, but there's so much going on in the world of movies that we definitely have to talk about. I know. I felt bad that I, like, info-dumped you. I'm like, hello, welcome, watch 18 trailers when you walk into the door today. And that's what we're starting off with. We start off our shows with movie news, any kind of general conversations. We have some three major trailers to talk about. It's kind of the wrap-up of CinemaCon. We had CinemaCon a couple weeks ago. If you don't know, it's a big kind of industry event where they showcase a lot of things. More for the industry, less for fans. It's not really a Comic-Con thing. All right. Let's talk about the first trailer that we watched. Transformers 1, I believe its name is. Yes. Which is a fitting name, I suppose. It's supposed to be a prequel, I guess, to all of the other Transformers stuff we've seen. Yeah, it looks like a Transformers animated movie. I don't think I don't think the, the premise of this is bad. Transformers animated Fine. We have the very classic 80s Transformers movie that started a lot of people's Transformers love. What did you think of this trailer, though? Yeah, you know, as far as the premise is concerned, I like the idea of exploring, you know, what's going on on Cybertron before everything that we've seen in the more recent live action movies. So I do like that. I'm not sure how I feel about the kind of buddy comedy aspect of Optimus and um, uh, Megatron and all of that. That... It, it feels like it's definitely made more for children, um, but maybe it is, and that, that's totally fine. I mean, it is a, a movie about a bunch of transforming vehicles. And so uh, Yeah, I think, you know, maybe that we should reclaim the, the child movies back to the children, like yeah. let them have it again, because the Transformers movies are very, at least, 13-year-old. Yes. I, you know, they're very at least a PG-13 kind of vibe, and they're marketed to that, geared for that, even older with the Michael Bay era, which was that little tinge of... Light racism, light misogyny, <laughs> just there, just yeah, sprinkle yeah. there. You know, very 2000s. Michael Bay is Michael Bay. I like that this definitely feels like a kid's movie. Yes. It feels like it's back to where it is. I don't love the animation style. I don't love the voice actors. Mm-hmm. Bring back voice actors. Bring back an actor whose job is to voice act. I don't need Chris Hemsworth as Optimus Prime. I don't like his Optimus Prime voice. I don't. I'm, I think I'm a little done with celebrity stunt casting for voice actors. I've been done for a while. I agree. What did you think of the voice cast? Yeah, as, as soon as I heard Scarlett Johansson, who I love, I love Scarlett Johansson, but she's not a voice actress, and it was definitely a little jarring to, you know, get these these actors and actresses that aren't well-versed in that particular area of acting, you know, and it is very different from stage mm-hmm. or screen acting, you know, you, you're only able to use your voice, and so you have to kind of overact in some ways in order to get the emotion across, and so someone who's not directly trained in that it's gonna be a little tricky so i would absolutely prefer if they got real voice actors who are versed in that process but you know hollywood's gonna hollywood and they need to sell tickets there is some who are good at i don't want to you know diminish that because i think like seth rogan has really grown into a voice actor he's on this new season of invincible yes the, the animated show uh i like his character i like his voice acting i don't hear just seth rogan i think jack black I mean, he's grown so much. I love his Bowser voice. Yeah. I thought that was like one of the, it sounds like Jack Black, but it doesn't, you know, you, you get the money. Like, oh, I paid for Jack Black. Right. I want Jack Black, but also act, yeah. <laughs> act, do a voice, do a character. And he did. I just feel like Optimus sounds like Chris Hemsworth doing slightly deeper, you know, less smoker. Cause you know, the uh, Optimus voice is iconic and he sounds like a 75 year old smoker. Like Absolutely. that's, that's the Optimus voice. This doesn't sound like that. And Scarlett Johansson, 
I don't think has a... I, she has a great voice. I don't want to say she doesn't have a good voice. I don't like her voice for voice acting. It seems very monotone and flat. And which, that's, which works in some regards, right? When she was in her, that worked yes. perfectly. And Lucy, where there's a lot of, like, a lot of voiceovers and you know, movies like that. It, 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 uh, meh. Uh, I don't really have much more to say. I think there's more juicier trailers to get into. Absolutely. Let's get into Joker 2. I'm a Lady Gaga stan. There's a Star is Born back here. I have a Gaga tattoo right here. Mm-hmm. This is my jam. I hated that first Joker movie. You, okay. Uh, okay, hate... No, I hated that first Joker movie. Wow. I, I did okay. not like it. I think uh, I didn't want to be lectured by Todd Phillips about mental illness. Okay. I didn't think he was the, the person for it. Um, I think Joaquin's performance was fine. I liked it. You know, it deserved its best, you know, best actor winner it's got. I just wasn't a fan. I, I, I was a little too Kings of Comedy. It was a little too Taxi Driver. You know, I, I got yes. what... It was very Scorsese. This does not feel like Scorsese. It's still referencing a lot of stuff. Todd Phillips seems to want to reference 70s films as well. I, I, I like this a lot more than I like the first one. One, it feels like it's camp. Yes. Which, I think sometimes the Joker needs to be campy, not dour. I think the Joker always needs to be at least at least a little campy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't hate the first movie. I I did have a bit of a sour taste just based on how people responded to it. But I think the movie itself was, I thought it was good. I think that it was obviously very inspired by movies like Taxi Driver, but that's fine. You know, it's okay to have a movie be heavily inspired by another movie. I mean, that's that's just part of the process. Um, I think what I enjoy most about this new trailer, and I'm hoping that they really lean into this, is that the Joker has proven himself to be a bit of an unreliable narrator. And a lot of what you remember from that first movie, we didn't really know if it was real or not, if it was just in his head, if it was actually happening. And I think we're going to get a lot more of that with this movie, where how much of this is actual song and dance that's occurring in the real world mm-hmm. of the movie, or is it all just in his head? And so I'm very excited to see that. Uh, you know, Todd Phillips also, I believe, was a producer on A Star is Born. Yes. So I, I think that he has perhaps some experience working with Lady Gaga to some degree. So I think that it's it's a good blend. It's a good combination of talent and you know, Todd Phillips doesn't have the best track record when it comes to sequels, but this might might prove to be uh, a little different. I kind of forgot about his Hangover movies being as bad as those Hangover sequels were. You know, well, next episode we're talking about comedies. Hangover, you know, I miss a good comedy like that. And I think that's kind of what I was let down by with the first Joker is there was no sense of wonderment or joy. It was so dour, it was so serious, so self-serious, too. Like, we get it. It's grim. Like, okay, right. you know, oh, fine. It was a little on the nose for me sometimes. Where this one, it feels on the nose, you know, but I feel like there's going to be an element that's unpredictable, and it's the Gaga element. What is she going to do? You know, is she, she's not throwing an accent, thank God. I watched House of Gucci. I don't need no more Cal- Dracula accents from Gaga. My girl, no more of that. But I like that she's doing something. I like this character, and I like that they're going to be unreliable narrators together. Right. And how much is what we're fighting for with whose narrative is who. We know Joker and Harley never stay together. No. Do we see that in this movie? You know, where do we go with their characters? There's a lot here that I think is we can dive into. There's a lot to eat with well. And I love that it's not a musical. From what Todd Phillips has said, this is not a musical. It is a movie with music, music elements. Right. So I don't think, you know, maybe once or twice we'll see Joaquin and Lagaga legit singing. But for the most part, I think it's going to be like, here's a two-minute musical number at a club. Mm-hmm. where other people are performing and, you know, it's good songs. I know Gaga has a couple covers she's done. There's one behind the scene footage that I've seen of her on the steps. Okay. Singing a song, and it is, it's chilling. Like, it's yeah. kind of, it leans into a little into spoiler territory, I think, for the movie. It looks great. So, I mean, the girl can sing. Like, so I'm, I'm excited to see what it does, and I'm also excited that uh, we've taken Joker away from the bros. <laughs> I, I, I've seen the online commentary, and, you know, Joker's gone woke is kind of the vibe we're going, which, yeah. love, li- lovely, love when that happens, but I kind of love that that uh, it was such a, even if the media put it on, it was such an incel movie for a lot of people. It was such a volatile movie of so much things that I love that, and now it's like, right. no, now it's a movie with Lady Gaga. Well, <laughs> like, it, I, I love that. I in, think it's fun. In that regard, it reminds me of something like Fight Club, to where it's it's people will take what they take from it, but you could argue that if you are watching the original Joker, or if you're like watching Fight Club for that, exa- for that for that matter, and you think that the protagonist of the movie is the hero, mm-hmm. 
I think you need to rewatch that movie with, with a different perspective. <laughs> yeah, no, you you 100% labeled why I had an issue with it, what was my things, and I think the wrong people saw it and took the wrong things from it. But, you know, we'll see how this one goes. I don't think it's going to be the billion-dollar movie that the first Joker was. Right. I think there was so much brewing with that hoopla, but there is not a single other DC movie this year. No. There's only really Wolverine and Deadpool. So there is a, a bit of a, a hunger for maybe a superhero property this, you know, this year. Well, you know, we'll talk about another superhero property a little bit later today that's feeding some people. But I, I really think there's going to be a hunger for it. I just don't know if this is going to be another $1.2 billion movie like Joker was. Yeah, I, I don't think that you can expect it to hit that mark again. But I am excited to see it. I think it's it's good to see Todd Phillips not just going and revisiting the well again, but kind of making some changes to it and trying some different things. So I'm absolutely going to be there to check it out day one. And I'm hoping that it's as good as the original, if not better. Yeah, I'm hoping I like it. <laughs> That's my bar bar for this one. So we have one more trailer to dive into. Another crazy director. You know, we're talking about filmmakers here. M. Night Shyamalan. I tweeted recently this week, I'm tired of pretending like I'm not a super fan of this man. I love M. Night. I think like, even at his worst, which I only think he's made two bad movies. Okay. Two bad ones. The, the Avatar, the last Airbender movie, and... Is it happening? Yes, <laughs> I think I think take out Marky Mark. That movie could be better. Um, Lady in the Water is my real bad one. Ah, okay. I, I think Happening is like banana cuckoo pants crazy. Yes. Where I enjoy it for it being Lady in the Water, another dour, way too serious. You know. Uh, so yes, Emma is back with Trapped. Trapped, just Trapped. Yes. Uh, Josh Hartnett's in it. You just saw the trailer for the first time. It's kind of blown up the internet this past week. What did you think of this trailer? Um, I. I kind of fascinated that it blew up the internet in the way it did because after watching the trailer you know it didn't it didn't blow me away or anything like that it, it seems I, I think what people are kind of uh getting a little uh you know uh excited about is that it appears that the trailer spoils a major plot point or spoils perhaps what people think might be the twist mm -hmm. because every M. Night Shyamalan movie has to have some sort of a twist or in the case of Cabin in uh Knock at the Cabin in the Woods uh, Knock nope. at the cabin, I think. Knock at the cabin. Uh, whatever that weird title yeah. was. Uh, in, the, in the case of that, the twist is that there is no twist. <laughs> so I think that people are expecting that going into into this trailer. Um, and I don't think there necessarily has to be a twist. I think the trailer is what it is. And the story could just be an exploration into the mind of a, a killer. I, I think you are right. I think, here's my prediction for a twist. I'm putting this on video and on the podcast for anyone here. I think it's the daughter's the killer. Oh. And I think he's having to... One kind of vibe, you know, okay. it's same with the same kind of with the thing, Ex exploration of a killer. But what happens when you're the parent of that? Right. And, you know, M. Night's really in dad mode right now. His daughter is the pop singer in this. His other daughter has a movie coming out this year that you can kind of see in a billboard in the background of this when they're kind of storming the thing. I think it's really fun. And I think M. Night has been talking about family for a long time. Mm -hmm. M. Night's a very family director. I think uh, Knock at the Cabin has that old. He loves to talk about family and I think he's in the mood. So I think that could be the extra layer to Twist. But like you said, it could just be Josh Harden. It's a bit crazy. Yeah. And we're watching him have to like break out. But you know, it's another protagonist that maybe not the best person to follow. He's not a good person. But there's still something there. There's still something you want to. So I, I think this looks really good, actually. I think it looks like a, a tight 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like it's not going to be too long. You hope. Uh, you would hope, but it might have been better. One, he's been self-funding these. You know, he's banging them out, though. Every, like, every two years, he's coming out with a release from old, not the cabin before that was glass. You know, he's been kind of consistent, and I'm kind of glad that he's back and just just doing this himself. Yeah, and as far as I know, I think M. Night tends to stay on schedule, under budget. So, you know, I don't think he's going to get a little, uh, you know, crazy with the, the, the length and, and scope of the movie. I'll, I'll tell you what I'm really excited to see, though, is Josh Hartnett. I... I've always been a bit of a Josh Hartnett fan. However, at the same time, I've always recognized that he hasn't been one to tend to stretch his acting muscles. You mean the faculty wasn't a, a stretch? Well, of his... I love the faculty. I, do, I love it too. <laughs> you know, but, but he tends to kind of stay in his pocket. Yeah. And I feel like now, as he's getting a bit older, whether it's with you know Oppenheimer, even though he's still he's great in Oppenheimer, he's great in Oppenheimer, I think he's starting to stretch his acting muscles a little bit. And I'm excited to see what he does with this. It's definitely it seems like it's the kind of movie that's going to require him to go to some different depths and, and to, to uh, kind of put on different faces. And so I'm very curious to see what he does here. No, I'm, I'm excited for Josh Hartnett. Really big fan. Really, just, I don't know, I'm excited for this year of movies. We're actually 
not that bad. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're building, even if they're not great, we have interesting developments happening. So that is our first section. Now let's get to our first commercial break, and we will be talking about Zack Snyder next. Oh boy. Oh boy. The Scar Givers among them. Those this village holds most dear. I shall destroy them. So we have a topic today we are diving into. It's an overall question that I've been wanting to ask, honestly, everyone who I've ever met. Is Zack Snyder a good director? Oh, EJ, you are you, you are going to set the internet on fire. I know, and look, I'm going to say it. If you look back here, I have a VHS copy that I have had personally customized of Batman v Superman. Zack Snyder is in my like top five favorite filmmakers. I like him. I think yeah. he's I think he's a, a hilarious guy. I love his interviews. I love that like that man does one podcast, and there is 15 quotes for the whole week because people are oh, yeah. very upset by everything about him, which I think is. That's what I like about him. I love the controversial nature. I love the very over-the-top vibe that he is. But is he a good filmmaker? After watching Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scar Giver, I have to question my fandom. I might, like, I'm, I'm, I visit the, the cult of Snyder. I go to the compound. Hey, guys, I don't want to be here. I might have to give up my key to the compound because what was this movie? What was Rebel Moon? What did you think of this? And I made you watch it. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. I, look, I had to watch it. I, I also am a big Zack Snyder fan. Maybe not as much as you. Yeah. Um, but I will say, I've liked 90% of the movies he's made to varying degrees. There's only a couple that I haven't really enjoyed. And unfortunately, these two Rebel Moon movies are a couple of those movies that are on the, the negative side of my Zack Snyder list. Um, this, you know, the first Rebel Moon, I think you liked a bit more than I did. Mm-hmm. I, I think with this second one, we're just getting more of the same, and it's it's kind of at this point you're you're doubling down with what you've already gotten, and so the it kind of compounds my displeasure when watching the movie. Where it's 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 like at this point, okay, we've gotten two plus hours of the first movie, now we've got another two hour movie, and still we're not getting some of the things that I would want to see from a movie like this. It it just feels. Um, it, 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 it feels wasteful. It feels like a, a waste of time and money and energy. And I, and I, one, I never want to agree with that because every movie deserves to exist, blah, blah, blah. But it, it feels like wasted potential is more how yes. I would put it. Because, like, I love the universe. I love the weird hierarchy of stuff. You know, the mothership and all the, the motherland and all that. I love all of what he's trying to set up. I like the characters as thin as they, I mean, paper thin characters, but I like them. I like Hercules guy. I like, you know, Sophia Boutella. I like all these people, but I can't tell you their names. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you real motivations for them other than let's put them all around a table and we can give all our backstories in a very long expo- oh, exposition of the, the, the usage of time in this movie, I guess, is the issue. Yeah, I, I, I'm very upset because I think what really hurts him here is that script. And I'm not saying we need to call Chris Terrio back up, but like, what say what you want about BVS, and I always kind of go back to it, but like Jesse Eisenberg is saying monologues. Like, you know what I mean? Ben Affleck has things to do. Amy Adams is, you know, trying to play a Pulitzer winner journalist. Like, you know what I mean? Things are happening. The monologues and the, the, the Granny's, you know, tea joke and all that. There's that, none of that is here. None of the charm that I usually find in a Snyder movie, because I find them to be, I, I wrote an article on Flickering Myth about Brokamp. Mm-hmm. I find him to be the king of Brokeham. Oh, yes. He loves over-the-top gleefully. He loves, you know, I, I you saw my thing about, you know, shirtless sweaty men. He he openly is very homoerotic with his filmmaking, but I just feel like th- th- this is missing that charm. I think it's something, yeah. just the piece wasn't there. I, I think that there are reasons why I love Zack Snyder, and some of those reasons are because he is so unapologetically who he is. He is such a visual director. He has such a unique style and perspective but at the same time you know it is incredibly rare to have a filmmaker who is strong in all of the necessary aspects of filmmaking and unfortunately as strong as he is in some of the more visual aspects he's just not when it comes to writing and i know coming from me that means next to nothing because i'm not a filmmaker myself but i think we can all kind of see it when we watch the movies that he himself has written and directed i think he needs a partner he needs someone there with him to kind of go through the script and and to make it more cohesive and more compelling and interesting you know it it, this just feels like it feels like someone who was given uh, a a ridiculous budget and just a bunch of toys to play with 
and and they're having fun. You can tell he's having fun with it, but th- it just lacks some of the foundational elements that you need to make a good story and a good film. I, I think what really hurts this is the universe aspect of it. You see how big this is, and it, it like you said, th- there's missing that fundamental stuff. And again, it's there. The story has a beginning, middle, and end. You know, the very basics of a story are there. It's just missing one a soul, mm. and it's missing. It, it, it tries to go through too much, and this is a problem I had with Dune. It's a problem I had, honestly, at times with Oppenheimer, which is interesting because these are all auteur people yes. who are writing these scripts as well, is I feel like they are they're trying to cram so much, even in long movies, Dune, Oppenheimer, these two are like four and a half hours or whatever. I feel like these could have been better serviced, especially Dune and Rebel Moon, as miniseries. And, you know, these are great people. If, if Denis Villeneuve wanted to do... Uh, an hour and a half Dune episode mm-hmm. every week. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And we would able to, you know, the thing, you know, I, I hate how rushed the ending of Dune is. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Those are things that I could have spent a little bit more time with. Same thing with Rebel Moon. I could have had a whole, the whole episode of them around the table could have legit been an episode. It would have been the exposition dumb episode and I would have been like, this is great. Like, it's a bottle episode. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, this is, it could have been really ep- interesting. And I think that's the disservice is some filmmakers are good, bold, especially sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Sci-fi nowadays we have too much money that we're giving these filmmakers. We have their their big ideas inspired by so many other things that it's almost a disservice to make them be limited to the space of movies. Do you think miniseries could have, and I know you're a Dune fan, so I'm not saying that you could have made it better, but do you think the stories, especially sci-fi, works better in a longer format? Yeah, I I think that we've kind of gotten into a weird place where everything has to be a a two-and-a-half-hour-long movie and a lot of stories would be better served with more of a, a serialization of them, you know, whether that's in a, a, a television series or, you know, a, a multiple parts. You know, you think back to kind of the, the origins of, of film at the movie theaters and how it would be these, these serialized, shorter stories that mm-hmm. they would tell over, you know, various um, iterations. And a lot of this, you know, we have the ability to do that now on streaming platforms at home. And I think a lot of this would be better served for that. I think the one thing that probably irritates me the most, though, about Rebel Moon, about what Zack Snyder's doing with it, is that Zack Snyder has expressed on a number of interviews, you know, he's, he's always wanted to speak his mind, and he has made it very clear that he doesn't like these movies, specifically these versions of these mm-hmm. movies. He doesn't like the PG-13 cut-up versions that we're getting on Netflix now. I don't now. really like them either. And, you can tell. And, and it's, it's kind of jarring that <laughs> Netflix is letting him say that. I mean, I guess maybe they can't really control what he says. Yeah. But he's made it very clear that these are not his movies, that, that these are not the movies that he intended to make. And a part of me, you know, respects his honesty there, but also then why make them? You know, then why watch? Not even not why make them. Why should we watch them? Yeah, and, you know, you know, going back to, like, Watchmen and BVS, which both have extended cuts, the mm-hmm. ultimate edition of BVS and Watchmen has, I think, just called the director's cut. These are movies that kind of came years after. You know, even Zack Snyder's Justice League, which that one doesn't really count because yeah. that one theatrical one was not his film. So it, it's interesting that, like, these are usually something he does when he's backed into a corner and has to, or what he wants to do now is just kind of do this with all his movies. He's talked about wanting to do more Sucker Punch, you know, fixing what he be- be- felt wasn't properly done by the studio. You know, now he's doing this thing, but I'm like, bro, no one put you into this predicament. Like, I don't know why you didn't just make the R-rated movie. There was enough crazy-ass movies on Netflix that yeah. the R-rated cut wasn't going to bother them. I, I, I don't understand the the marketing. The, the I don't know who to blame because it feels slightly Netflix. It feels slightly Snyder. I don't know who... What is, but, you know, they literally fired their film executive at Netflix not yeah. too long ago, got a new guy in. I don't know. It feels like, I feel like it was a disservice to everyone involved doing this, like I said, because I, I will never watch these two again. No. Maybe I would check out the R-rated cuts. And, Maybe, though. You know what I mean? that's the problem, is that now, because we have such a nasty taste in our mouth with these movies, even regardless of whether or not the R-rated cuts are going to be good, I mean, they could be amazing, but how many people are going to see that pop up on Netflix and be like, I'm not watching that again. Yeah. I, I hated the original. Why am I going to watch the extended version? So he, I feel like they kind of shot themselves in the foot. And, and I do want to believe that this is more of a Netflix decision than a Zack Snyder decision. You know, obviously, director cuts and extended editions have been around since the dawn of physical yeah, media. I joked right? about how many cuts of Blade Runner exist. Yeah. But with, with Zack Snyder in particular, you know, he obviously ran into some family issues with you know, losing his daughter, and that's why he couldn't complete 
um, the original uh, Justice League. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so he had to come back, or was, was fortunate enough to come back later and to, to finish that movie. And it almost feels like Netflix, and I'm going to blame it on Netflix because I don't want to blame it on Zack Snyder because it is such a sensitive subject, but it feels like they're kind of using that same energy to double dip here and make a little bit more money on this on these movies. And so that kind of also leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It, it's a little icky and you know, it, it, I feel like it's, it's kind of shooting themselves in the foot because when those extended editions do come out, I think a lot fewer people are gonna wanna watch them. Yeah, I think everyone wants the release the Snyder Cut vibe that we had. I mean, that was a movement in film. Yes. We, that, honestly, we'll never see again. Like we got fans pushed for that movie. It wasn't just Snyder. Snyder was, but then, you know, the, the oh, yeah. cast would come in. And that got, that was such a, a anomaly in film is fans got a cut of a movie and then he still had time, the extra money that he was given and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I, 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 I want to believe that this was just a weird studio messing with stuff, but to be honest, I, I, I don't know. So let's, let's get back to that question that I asked at the beginning. Is X Snyder a good director? Yes or no? Yes. I think he is a good director. I think he is a subpar writer. Yeah, I would say he is better at humans than people give him credit for. Again, I love the the vibes of Man of Steel. I think it's a, it's a sweet movie at times. Mm -hmm. You know, I love the Ma Pa Kent stuff. I love the, I like that. I think Watchmen is painfully human. It's some of the gross yeah. sides of humanity. So I love that, you know, I do think he's better with talent and at directors, because I think sometimes we just kind of call him a visual director. Mm -hmm. I think he works well with talent. Like, Jackie, who, someone had to direct Jackie O'Haley as Rorschach, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which, did you hear that Tom Cruise wanted to play that role? That would have been fascinating. Again, in the, the <laughs> Zack Snyder interviews, him just dropping that bomb, that's good. So I would agree with you, I do think he needs a writer. Um, you know, but again, even I, I, I like Nolan. I think Nolan struggles when it's just Nolan. I love a, I love a Jonathan Nolan and Christopher yes. Nolan script. Uh, Christopher by himself, sometimes I'm like, maybe not my favorite experience. But you know, I think Snyder needs that partner. You know, yes. I, I, you and know. Jonathan Nolan kind of killing it right now with Fallout. So yeah, you know, so you know, we see that there, it's good. Yes. I, I want Snyder to be better. I think he has everything there. He is one of the funniest people. One of the most entertaining personalities we have yeah. he's very Tarantino he's very John Waters where I'm like we don't get a lot of views like just a director who wants to do whatever they want to do and will say you know middle finger up to the air about <laughs> it night you know another example I just want it to be better my goodness all right let's wrap up our segment and let's get to our title of the show what should we watch tonight that's next Three, five, all right the title of our show is what should we watch tonight where we throw each other suggestions now, I have one for everyone and one for you, but I know yours is uh, kind of on the back list now. Yeah. X-Men 97. If you guys are not watching it, I know we're trying to stay with movies, binge this. It's only like 28 minute episodes. You know, it's an animated series. X-Men 97 to me is the best thing happening on television right now. Wow. Uh, it, it, every Wednesday, you know, you know, Wednesday morning, I'm waking up so excited to go into my favorite X-Men. Uh, X-Men are my favorite superhero people. Mm. Um, I'm a Justice League person, an X-Men person. I love my teams, and I love good teams. And this feels like a team effort. Also, for years of X-Men stuff, Wolverine is not front and center. And I'm happy about that. I love Wolverine, but you know those movies really shoved him down our throat, much yeah. like DC does with Batman. So I'm really happy to see Wolverine's kind of just in the background, just being Jean Grey's, <laughs> you know, oh, I, uh, I love me some Jean Grey. I'm like, still, get over it, bro. But no, it's so, so good. It's to me one of the best things on television right now. What I loved is when it started, so many people were getting ready to, you know, woke it. Oh, it's the worst thing ever. And I'm like, those people shut up. Once it dropped, there's not been that many videos about that. Uh, you know, controversial film, uh, the creator of it, Bo DeMaio, uh, was fired from this. Oh, I he, didn't know. he wrote the first two seasons, was the showrunner of it, and got fired. And I don't know what he did because it's not the quality of his work. Wow. So I don't know what happened over there, but it's truly great. And I know you're watching X-Men right now. Yes. How are you enjoying the OG X-Men? So I grew up watching the original X-Men animated series, and I absolutely love it. Of course, I haven't watched it in, in quite some time, so I've gone back. I just finished the first season. I'm on the second season now. Um, first off, I want to say anybody who is complaining about the new X-Men animated series being woke, have you ever watched X-Men or yeah. read an X-Men comic book? It's always, that's the whole point. Literal <laughs> civil rights, like they are literal social justice warriors. Yeah. That is what their job is. That's the whole point <laughs> of X-Men. That is the whole point of X-Men. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's so, I, I loved when that was happening because I'm like, 
did we do we know who the X Men are? Like, yeah. So I, I I love the original series. It actually really holds up. I'm, I'm rewatching it now. I have not gone into X Men '97, but man, it is taking everything in my willpower to not just stop watching the original and jump right to that. Do you think that that is something that someone could do? Do you need to watch that original series in order to know what's going on with this new one? Or, or where do you stand on that? There is wonderful YouTube videos where they kind of do a previously on okay. that I think even released by you know Marvel Animation and stuff that was kind of like, kind of gives you the key points. You know, there are certain things that you need to know by the end of the series of like where Charles Xavier kind of sends his character off to. I don't right. know if you know oh, yeah. Spaceman Charles Xavier. <laughs> we get to see him, woo, he pops up and I'm like, Yay! Uh, so I, I I love what it is, but you know I don't think so. Okay. Uh, especially if you know X Men, like oh wow, has Jean Grey and Xavier died at one point? Yeah, they're probably gonna die in another two episodes. <laughs> those two especially are always you know what I mean. It's one of those things. If you know X Men, it's not too hard to get into. Okay. Uh, but you do need a little bit of it because there were some you know certain characters like bishops here. Uh, you know we're having some Mr. Sinister kind of pop up, who was vaguely in the original yeah. run, um, but you know, not as a big center as he, he seems to be here. I, we're not even done with the season, so we, I don't even know who the big bad is. It's still very thing, but you know, it will help, especially emotionally. There is an episode here, episode five, called Remember It. Okay. I compare it to The Red Wedding. Wow. It is, it is the most, when that ended, I sat and stared at my television for a couple <laughs> minutes of being like, did, did you really just slap me in the face like that? It is one of the best episodes of television I've ever seen. Wow. Um, and not to give you too much on it, but it does focus with Genova. It is a little Magneto. It's a little uh, Gambit and Rogue focused. Okay. Great characters. Really good. The voice acting. You know, a lot of people criticize the voice acting because some have come back. Some have been replaced. It sounds great. But the voice acting in Five, when they get to act, mm. oh, it's great. And if you're a Storm fan... They've the store marks are great here. It's just it's really fun. It's a lot of fun, and I cannot believe I'm praising something on Disney Plus this much. I I man, now I feel like I just have to skip right to it because uh, wait, enjoy your run, enjoy your run. It will be better for it. Now, Tony, what is your suggestions for what should we watch tonight? I hear you had a quite an interesting journey oh, for this. Oh boy, so you know for this particular segment, I always like to go back and look at movies that are celebrating major anniversary milestones. You know, 10, 20, 30 years um, or more, if possible. And one that I was looking at that's celebrating a major anniversary milestone is a little movie called 16 Candles. You mm -hmm. may have heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, now, I had somewhat remembered 16 Candles, but I hadn't watched it in a very long time. So I went back to watch it for this podcast. Boy, that movie, I don't think I can recommend that movie. <laughs> that yeah. is, it is rough. It is um, very... Yeah. Problematic. Now, granted, I know it came out in 1984. It was yes. a different time. You know, we didn't we didn't have the same perspective that we have now. But if you're watching that for the first time from a 2024 point of view, uh, there are a lot of troubling things that occur in that movie. I mean, racism, sexism, all the isms that Isn't you can think of. Is there a yellow of. face in that movie too? Um, Doesn't someone dress up like an Asian person who is not an Asian person? Oh, is gosh. that 16? Can it's one of those that no, I, I. No, I think you're thinking of. Um, Oh my gosh! Uh, so Sixteen Candles has a uh, Long Duck Dong. Yes. Who uh, is a, an, an Asian American actor? Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Who is from I think Utah, and they had him doing the most stereotypical. Yes. Okay. I Chinese. remember there was something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and I'm not blaming anyone involved because I might be interviewing Anthony Michael Hall soon. Oh. So nothing to do with him. No. He, he was great. He's and great. Him and Molly, Love him. Uh, Molly Greenwald's good. It's just it's a sign of the time. So what was your real pick for this okay, week, though? Okay, so my real pick for the week is another movie celebrating, this one, a 20-year anniversary. And, boy, I, I love this movie so much. And it is uh, starring Denzel Washington and Dakota Fanning, a little movie directed by none other than the late Tony Scott, uh, Man on Fire. Oh, wow. Like, one, I was like, which Denzel Saving a White Girl movie was this? Because, unfortunately, yeah. that's how I kind of rack some of these. And I'm like, not The Equalizer 3, which also stars both of these people that just came out last year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, wh wh why this one? Why? Well, you know, first off, I think Tony Scott is an, un an underrated director. I think he was really phenomenal, um, you know, Top Gun, yeah. of course. <laughs> he, he's... He was a very talented director. Unfortunately, he took his own life, and uh, you know he, he had the potential to create so many more great movies. I think Denzel Washington. This might be his best performance, just just flat out. You know, taking into account uh, Malcolm X and Training Day, and I think Denzel in this movie is able to explore so much of his emotional range. You know, whether it 
is regarding um, the, the rage that he shows mm -hmm. on screen, uh, or, and I don't want to spoil any of the plot points of the movie, so I'm going to try to dance around it as much as I can. There are moments where he is just able to fully let that out. There are moments where there's somber uh, reflection and just really quiet moments where there's so much em emotion on his face. I think Dakota Fanning was, I mean, very young. I don't know exactly how young in this movie, but she is also phenomenal in it. You know, you've got um, <laughs> Mark Anthony is in this movie, yes. which is fascinating, and is he's actually pretty good. I was All very... the time he's good in a movie, because he has those movies with J-Lo. Yeah. Not great. I was pleasantly surprised. You know, it, it's just, it is uh, one of the great revenge films. Mm. One of one of those really cathartic kind of, you can, you can feel the emotion and, and the justification of the hero going and just doing the most horrifically brutal things yeah. to these bad guys, and they deserve it. Now, we need a whole Denzel episode just to fully dive into it, because when you said favorite performance, mine is actually a recent one, The Tragedy of Macbeth. I oh, think he is okay. absolutely phenomenal in that movie. I mean, yes. Denzel reading Shakespeare, it, it, it sounds good, it feels right, like it's good. It, it's everything, everything he says though feels like Shakespeare. Yeah. He's just one of those actors. Again, we need a whole Denzel episode. So. Man on Fire, is this something you own? Is this something we can find online? I have to go look it up now. I'll put it a little lower third of where you can find yeah, it. Yeah, please do. Because I... it, this has to be something you own, because you seem passionate oh, about yes, it. Oh, yes, yes. Of, of course I own it on Blu-ray. It's it's definitely one of those movies that if, if you have a Denzel collection, this needs to be right at the top of that. Okay, good. If you guys have your Denzel collections out there, make sure you guys get ready. All right, let's wrap up our show, and let's get to the wrap up and let's get to our next episode because I'm so excited for that as well. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of What Should We Watch Tonight? We talked about Denzel Washington, Zack Snyder, <laughs> M. Night Shyamalan, so many things. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you so much this week for joining me, Tony. Why did that sentence sound so weird in my head? My goodness. Thank you again. Uh, this <laughs> has been great. Where can we find you? Yeah, you can find me on YouTube at Impressive Tony. Uh, I do movie reviews and, and all that good stuff. I love your trailer reactions. They're always really fun. You guys can find me here at Flickery Myth or on my channel, EJ Marino. Thank you guys for tuning in. And let's talk about what you guys want to watch right down there.